to the next episode of Ad Talks. Today, we are diving into how to build AI-powered companies while empowering your team to embrace innovation. I'm your host, in Horvat, and joining me today is Jost Delay, a strategic facilitator and the founder of Limelights. Jost has spent years helping leadership teams simplify complexity, achieve impactful results, and drive AI adoption that lasts. And in this episode, we'll explore five essential lessons on AI-powered growth, building a culture of curiosity, and overcoming barriers to change. So you can see by my voice that I'm super excited on the topic and the guests that we are having. So hi, Jost. Hi, Ina. Welcome. I'm really happy to be here. Thanks so much for inviting it's been a pleasure. So we usually start uh, from rapid fire questions that we summarize by the end of the season. And with that, let's start from the quest- first question. What book or resource can you recommend on L&D or educational topic? Mm, yes, my all time favorite book in, in this space is uh, Sprint from Jake mm-hmm. Knapp. And um, Sprint describes kind of how you can push yourself and experiment a lot. And I think that's really my guiding thought in almost all projects I do. How can you experiment and learn as much as possible in limited time? And the book describes uh, how at Google, now one and a half decade ago, they designed the design sprint methodology, a five-day approach for testing big ideas. So day one, map. Day two, sketch. Day three, uh, decide what you want to prototype. Do that on day four. And then on Friday, where it's really the magic, test all your prototypes with real users. And I think there's such an accelerated learning curve. Um, so for me, that's my Bible for L&D, for learning and development, for all the programs mm-hmm. that I design. It's very much this fast process of getting out there with prototypes to 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 customers, to potential clients, all these kind of things. So Sprint is my, um, my number one tip. Sounds fantastic. And it's certainly on my to-read list right now. So next one is, who do you recommend to follow and invite to this podcast from l and experts? Um, yeah, I think for me, that's right now at the moment, Ethan Mollick. Um, he's an American professor. He's very much into the AI space and he does a lot of experiments with his class on AI. So he gives his students lots of experiments and, and then shares on LinkedIn about it. So I would definitely recommend following him on LinkedIn to get a little bit of a sense of what he's doing. Also, he wrote a really good book, uh, Co-Intelligence, which is all about AI and how everybody will get their own AI tutor. Um, so definitely, yeah, follow him, uh, check out his work. He's really great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every post that he creates on LinkedIn catches the immediate attention of hundreds and thousands of people, probably, and I'm one of them yeah. as well. So, uh, nice, nice. Yeah. Uh, could you share a memorable failure or a setback in your L&D journey, and how did you overcome it? Yes. Um, yeah, so maybe it's good to first say, like, I'm not only working in the L&D space. Uh, I work a lot with leadership teams, uh, but also as a client, I have a lot of L&D teams. And I think in, within L&D, one of the yeah, big setbacks that I had now, now I've experienced already a couple of times that I get asked for a briefing for like an experiential program, really with a lot of, yeah, big objectives, basically. And then I design those kind of programs. And then in the end, it's like maybe a pitch with other companies and then they choose to do e-learning. And I'm still amazed. I can really not understand because I see the numbers of e-learning in companies and I, I don't really understand why e-learning is still there in the L&D space um, because it's usually not used that much, at least in the topics that I uh, I work on. So for example, we a company like bought like AI e-learning and then you see like seven people using it in a, in a 60,000 people population. So for me, um, e-learning has been a setback for me a couple of times that I get like a brief for like really experiential learning and then in the end they choose like e-learning. It happened to me a couple of times and I deal with that kind of setbacks by being much more um, critical at the beginning of a, a briefing at, uh, at the beginning of project and saying no more, which is very difficult. It's an ongoing challenge saying no more to briefings that I get and, and requests that I get. Mm-hmm. Okay, that sounds interesting. You know, I see uh, you're doubting eh, about e-learning. I think you noticed <laughs> Tell me. my uh, yes, yes expression that I, I wasn't sure if I'm on the same page with you. <laughs> But, uh, you know, I used to be an e-learning designer, so uh, yeah. I've been there, but I totally agree with your uh, point that y- you might assign to hundreds of 
people, but the end result is several enrollments in the end of the day. So that's, yeah. I think we should, might have another conversation on why learning <laughs> fails and what are the topics. For instance, AI yeah. might not be the best uh, topic for an e Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. be related to the topics also. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, e-learning is great because I love e-learning myself, but it's like for people that really are eager to learn, I think it works. They are the seven people enrolling. And I think to engage like a large, larger audience on learning, they are, yeah, they're not like motivated themselves to really tune into e-learning um, unless you do it mandatory, which I'm not a big fan of. But we can have another episode on this. Uh. I think so. I think we are really onto something because what we are discussing right now is a huge point for many, many LD specialists uh, yeah. all around the world. So in Quickly. any case, we have to move on with uh, this question. So if you were to conduct a job interview for an LD specialist, what question you think is a must to ask? Yeah, no, it's a nice question. Um... I w if I were, were running like interviews with um, L and D people, I would ask, "How do you learn yourself? Um, and how do you use AI to learn faster?" Those th those two questions, I would really be super curious to 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 see what they answer. Um, one is, yeah, the, the first one I think gives you a really good indication of if, if they understand learning types, uh, how people learn. And the second one, also, are they ready for the next phase in L&D, which I, I think will be, yeah, L&D can really be AI powered in many senses. Do you think that we've come to a point where question on how do you use AI has become a must? I think so, yeah. Yeah, but I, I do feel that many L&D teams are not ready for those, uh, for not asking those questions because their companies are maybe also not ready for it. So for me, it would be a must, but I think the general L&D team in a, in a large corporate or any is not asking those questions yet. Yeah, 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 yeah. And last but not the least, if you had to give one piece of advice for someone who has just started their career in L&D, what would that be? I guess, uh, but that's maybe also... For my role, so I'm a strategist facilitator, I always first ask, you know, what's the strategy? Uh, how can we connect any L&D initiative to that? And many times you see that there's not a like a good cascade or doesn't connect very well. So my advice for anybody starting an L&D is instead of asking like, hey, what are all the e-learnings we have active and what are the people doing them? I would say like, hey, what's actually the strategy of the company? Uh, where does the company want to go? And how can L&D be an enabler of that? Um, that would be really my starting point to have these kind of strategic discussions with your stakeholders in the company and and not only talk about uh, this, how we're going to do it. So uh, agnostic approach uh, without thinking in the means that you're going to execute and really connect it to the strategic objectives of the company. Yes, yes. So basically what problem we are trying to solve, not which training do we need, because sometimes that's not. Yeah, the case. yeah. And do you need a training actually for that, or is it peer to peer learning? Um, yeah, those those kind of things I would would definitely emphasize uh, for anybody starting in L and D right now. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, moving on to the main part of our conversation. So, um, as I mentioned, our conversation is built on five lessons that you have summed up for yourself. Maybe a bit of the context would help. So. Yeah. How did you sum up these lessons, and why do you think that uh, these are going to actually help someone who is facing the issue of implementing AI within their own L&D or the company? Yeah. Yeah. So I was asked by the L&D Shakers uh, community last month to, to join their AI month, where 11 experts were sharing how they approach uh, AI in, in trainings and workshops, hackathons. And it was really nice to be, to be asked for that. And in the last Two years, uh, more or less, I, I trained more than 2,000 people in AI. So I did a lot of workshops with leadership teams, uh, seeing, okay, where should the company focus on AI, but also like complete departments on productivity, on creativity, innovation. So I did a lot of different different sessions. And when they asked me like, hey, do you want to be part of the AI month? Um, I said, yeah, sure, of course, love to share my learnings. It's also a nice challenge for yourself to, to think about what did I actually learn? Because... And many times you're in just in the process, new assignments, new training. But when do you actually step back and, and zoom out and, and really think, hey, what's actually this body of work now uh, after two years? So that's what I did for, for them. I took like a, like a day where I, I looked back at all the sessions that I did and, and see 
the reaction from participants, trainings that really excited me, and, and what are kind of the, the, the ingredients that that came out of them. And and from from there, I, I distilled five lessons that I think will really help anybody that is trying to build an AI powered company, uh, and especially in L and D. Like, so the five lessons in in a nutshell are experiment, change, impact, invest, and differentiate. And with all of them. There's of course some context in it, um, and I think these five lessons, like if you, if you distill one learning from it, is the key is getting your people to go along on this journey because there is a resistance on this topic, and it's not easy to get everybody excited about it and really in for the next years. Well, it will have major implications for all people's strategies at all companies. So we can go deeper in all five of them in a bit, I think. But yeah, that's a little bit of context uh, how how um, yeah, how yeah I will get to, to these five lessons. Yeah, so uh, the five lessons are actually, once I've heard them, they're quite logical, right? So this is what you actually do once you face a new black ground breaking technology. However, uh, there are some questions that I think we must cover. And yep. first things first, when it comes to examples that it's quite hard to share uh, because mostly you are, might be not allowed or it's just not at the place to create any conclusions, right? And it's a bit too early for that. But I think that's how why your experience is so unique because after all the hours of the, and the companies that you've done, not just one company, and you can sum up the conclusion based on several uh, cases. So that's what we are going to try to do. And the first lesson was experiment, as you mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. And if we can start right away from any examples of how companies can create structured experiments. So how do you yeah. scale them? Yeah. Yeah. So maybe it's good to say like um, it was not one company that I did these sessions with, but the bulk has been done with one company. So I was very, uh, yeah, Privilege actually to to work with a Fortune 500 company um, that was really keen on AI from the start. So I think it was just a couple of months after ChatGPT got launched that they got their own internal ChatGPT and really said, okay, help us design lots of sessions for for HR, for marketing, for finance, for legal. So lots of different things. And to our approach was from the start that. We have to set like the, the the kind of a playing ground where people can do controlled experiments, because the only way that you can get uh, upskill yourself with AI is just by doing it. It's not by just listening and inspiration sessions. Obviously, we also put those in, but we mainly created like a safe space for experiments. Um, and how we did that was by again connecting it very strongly to the strategic objectives of the company, the strategic objectives of that team, and then play in that area. So we gave people inspiration and then, for example, did a hackathon uh, or we did an innovation accelerator where all the guidelines were set by us. So it was in the play gr playing ground predefined based on strategic priorities, but they're giving people a lot of freedom to come up with new projects, new pilots, new ways of working for themselves. And I think these levels, so you have like more the personal level where we did experiments, and the more company department level where we did experiments, yeah, that combination was really working very well. And if I can give one example, um, the two like frameworks that I, I use a lot in these sessions, one is a personal AI playbook where you really look at your own role and you say, okay, how is AI going to change my working life in the coming years? What should I actually learn myself? What capabilities do I need to kind of capture this opportunity? And then also, how can AI help me build this? And then really very pragmatic, look back at the last weeks. How can I like, kind of use a prompt for repetitive work? How can I really make that faster? So this this was on the personal side. We used a lot and, and people really liked it, that they got time in a structured way to think about their own L&D journey. And then the second framework that we used a lot was the AI Opportunities Radar. It's a framework from Gartner. And it really says, okay, if you look at a company or a department level, what is game-changing AI? What is everyday AI? What's front office? What's back office? And where do we actually map the opportunities for a company? Mm -hmm. And those two frameworks I've been using a lot um, next to other ones, obviously, also. And it really helped in like a very structured approach to experimenting as well on a personal level as on like a team or company level. 
sounds exciting and I love that you're kind of giving the opportunity to explore on themselves, however, providing the clear structure, because when it comes to AI, just as you mentioned, um, there is a lot of resistance, which leads yeah. us to the second lesson, which is change. Yeah. So when it comes to this resistance, it's all about the leaders. I think with AI, especially it's a top down approach. So how can leaders support employees and help them overcome these fears about regarding the AI adoption? Yeah. Yeah, this is a big question, and I, I would not say that I have like a the the the, the answer to it. However, based on my experience, I, I did find that many times the leaders of the teams or companies are really excited about AI because they see like, oh, hey, efficiency, we can be twenty percent more efficient. Oh, we can be better, and they almost think that it will go automatically. People will just adopt it. Uh, are they also assume that people are also excited about it? Mm -hmm. But then, if you work on on the team level, really in the teams, then you you get different perspectives. Obviously, because some people, yeah, feel that their job is threatened, or they're like, hey, I actually don't want AI to look over my shoulder and work with me. I don't like this kind of technology. So there's lots of different sentiments there, and and one story really um, really stands out for me. I, I was doing a two-day innovation session in Budapest uh, more than a year ago. Um, really, really nice session, very much around AI and and yeah, kind of on innovation. And at the end of the first day, um, one of the participants um, was sharing with me that this was the worst day of his life. And that's something that you, you don't want to hear when you just facilitated a, a very actually successful workshop. Um, so that night over dinner, um, I, I talked quite long with him and I asked like, hey, why why was this so so bad for you? Um, because he literally meant it. And he said a couple of things. So one, I kind of realized during the day that uh, my job will be obsolete in a couple of years. AI can take it, take over my job. It's not, it's very much, I see, I see this happening. Second, I'm very much about human interaction, uh, working together with teams. Uh, I'm not this digital person. So I don't like this whole, uh, yeah, working with machines, basically. And third, he said, yeah, maybe in the future I will join like an anti-AI group or I will become an activist against AI because I see too much risks. I see too much downside of it. Um, and I think it will not be good for humanity. So that was, you know, really great conversation to have um especially because i'm i'm on the other side i'm too optimistic obviously uh, that's why i do this work so it was really good for me also to 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 have this like conversation and and just realize that change and change management is so key and that as a leader you really have to tackle those fears with optimism you have to guide your people to the journey and and really build their confidence in the future you cannot just like go, hey, use AI, it's not there. Like change is really, yeah, the one of the key lessons. And I, I keep hearing it back from, from sessions with, with people. It's a bit off topic, I know, but um, I'm pretty sure that my listeners are having uh, the same thought in their head. What did you tell to this uh, person regarding yeah, this? Yeah, no, it, 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 it was more for me from listening, to be honest, um, because uh, I, I think, you know, I told, I, I talked all day about all the opportunities and innovation. Mm -hmm. And we really got very far that day eh, on the innovation mm -hmm. side. It was a very complex session. It was really successful. So he heard me talking a lot that day. So for me, this was just really listening. And okay. I also can imagine that there will be <clears throat> anti-AI groups. I think it will lead to uh, social uh, disruptions that are not positive. So this is really like a yeah, crossroad for humanity how we choose to use it, uh, how we can implement it, how can we also put gu guardrails uh, there? Because it's it's not it's it's a big topic, no? Yeah. So absolutely. I didn't say I didn't say like you know, comfort him. I just really don't listened. Don't worry about that. <laughs> don't worry. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, but I think that you and I we share the same enthusiasm. Just as you mentioned, you're overly optimistic. Same for me. And how do you balance this excitement for short-term AI wins? You know, what we have, like we have a shiny new tool or we have something yeah. which is speeded yeah. up and the leaders are excited, just as you mentioned, with 20% increase of performance. And that comes to lesson three, which is impact. Yeah, yeah right? definitely. Yeah, so in, in my sessions, I, you know, 
one part, and you see that also, for example, in the personal playbook, is really about how can it make you better, faster? How can you get more happier? Because those are the results MIT measures eh, on, on use of ChatGPT. People get faster, better, and happier, which is awesome. So that's very much on the short-term wins for you personally. But when we look at like the long-term impact, and that's that's lesson number three indeed, focus on long-term impact. How are you going to completely change your value proposition, for example? How are you going to completely update your ways of working front and back end? Like there's so much opportunities. And there you come to much more critical parts. For example, if you want to really do something on the more game-changing side, your data needs to be in order. Um, you need to have ownership of your data. There's so much questions coming there. And I like to touch upon those. Also with teams, even if they're not senior leadership teams, I think it's important for them to realize AI will have a big impact on our company, on our team. And it's not just a productivity gain or just a new tool that can help me become better. It's really something that will change how companies will work. So I, I really emphasize a lot that this long-term um, yeah, in a, it is long-term innovation. It's not just a hype that will fade away, which some people still think it is. Um, while I'm 100% sure because I listen to those kind of podcasts mm -hmm. that right now there's, uh, especially in Silicon Valley, but for sure also across the world, there's investors investing in companies that are fully AI powered and have the assignment, for example, hey, go disrupt company X, go disrupt this big multinational with AI. No, build the same. See if you can do it with 10% of the people. Uh, those kind of questions are coming up. And I think that the, the short-term impact is a little bit overestimated, while mm -hmm. the long-term impact is underestimated. So it's really my role as a, as a strategist facilitator to make sure that they understand the impact on the longer term. Um, and it's not only, oh, I, I will get 10% more productive in the coming three months. Okay. Coming up to the question, to the lesson number four, which is yeah. interest. So yeah. I've been to several of your sessions and you've mentioned that investing in training and change management is just as important and as investing in AI technology itself. So why yeah. is Yeah, I must say that um, I, I um, visit every year the um, Autonomous Innovation Summit, which is a two-day uh, summit around uh, artificial intelligence, innovation, organized by the Board of Innovation. Um, it's very, very inspiring. And their uh, CEO last year mentioned this this quote. It's like, for every dollar you invest in tech, invest two in people and change. And that really st stuck with me because that's exactly what I see all the time. Because people spend lots of money in new shiny AI tools, um, really like all the time. So I see this, you know, people even come with briefings to me, like we want to do with AI, we want to do this tool, um, which it's my my role then to say like, hey, awesome, you know, let's explore. But the mindset and the skill set is, is more important than the tools that you use. So you know, obviously you need to have the best possible tool, but it doesn't matter which one it really is if you don't get the full potential out of it. So I think this mindset, AI first, the skill set, how to actually get more out of your AI tools, that's really important. So that's why this quote uh, is really important for me. And and so lesson four is really about investment. And if I were the leader of company and I would have 30,000 euros budget for AI for my team for the coming half year, I would say 20,000 euros on change management, training, mm -hmm. getting people along the journey, upskilling them, and maybe 10 in a tool, maybe even less. Interesting. Speaking of people, uh, you answered this qu question partly, but I was wondering if there are any types of training that work best when it comes to upskilling people in terms of AI. Yeah, I, I learn by doing for sure. That's that's for sure the the full yeah the best practice. So I, I see this time by time after time, and it's, um, if you look at our trainings, seventy five percent is doing and twenty five percent is listening max, probably even more, and it just works all the time to get people engaged. And uh, to give you an example, my most recent AI training was last Thursday for fifty uh, people, communication uh, um, professionals from different companies. And the first hour was just like 
we experimented with five different tools. So we made a video together. We made like a AI duplicate of somebody. We made a song together. We did a full campaign with ChatGPT. And what was the fifth one? Uh, an image with Midjourney. So, but just this five experiments, like really like a playground in the first hour, everybody got excited, even the most cynical people. And then mm -hmm. the second hour, we went deeper in what is it actually, where's the value? Like, so a different way. So really let them do things and experience it and then teach them where it comes from and how you can get more out of it. So yeah, for sure, learn by doing is the approach to get people along. And especially with this subject, I guess it's not that difficult to make people excited because, well, it's it's here, it's it's in your yeah. lap. You just need to put a little bit of effort in there. Yeah. And lastly, so lesson five is differentiate. So yeah. here the floor is yours, if you could share. Yeah. What yeah, honestly, this is the most complex one. So if you are um, in L and D and you are or like hiring people to 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 do sessions on AI, or you're giving them yourself, one key lesson after, especially specifically now, you have to differentiate your trainings because if you have a room with fifty people or a room with a hundred people, ten people are better than you. They are experts themselves. They are maybe even building their own models, but 10 other people in that room have never touched it before. So if your training is completely the same for everybody in that room, it will suck. You you won't get the engagement that you that you want. So it's not an easy one because how do you differentiate in in a in a in a group? So I noticed that at, let's say when I started with these kind of trainings, that was literally like two weeks after ChatGPT got launched, I did my first training. And then it was easy for everybody it was the same playing field. It was really like everybody, wow, super excited. Fast forward like one and a half years, two years now almost, you get this, you have to differentiate. So I try to know before training, where are the levels? That's really key. That's one. And then I differentiate. So for example, when I did a hackathon for HR, like uh, with 150 people, there was three breakout rooms online they could choose from. Beginner level, Meteor and advanced, and then each breakout obviously completely different program. That's not so easy because you need three facilitators to run those. You can also do it that you kind of use the the, the experts in the room to teach novices. So there's mm -hmm. different ways you can approach this, but I do think lesson five is not the easiest one. It's differentiate your trainings, but on this topic you kind of need it. Otherwise, it will be very mediocre trainings. I think. I suppose that within a couple of years, the gap between the novices and the experts will be even bigger. So the job is going to become even farther. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, yes. On the other hand, I think if l and uh, adopts an AI uh, approach, everybody will have their own, their own AI tutor. It's I, I'm, not, I'm not 100 percent sure about it, and maybe there's no AI training needed on the basic level that's done now. Sometimes, so I, mm -hmm. I'm not sure about it. Yeah, sometimes Indeed. we confuse people. We might confuse yeah. people too much. <laughs> but with that, let's summarize the episode, if you don't mind. So, thank you so much for tuning in to this live to this episode of Ed Talks, and a big thank you to our guest. Yos Delay for sharing five magnificent lessons on driving AI-powered growth and creating future-ready team. If you found this episode inspiring, please don't forget to follow Ed Talks for more conversations that shape the future of learning, leadership, and innovation. Until the next time. Mm -hmm.